On today's episode, we have Gina Horky. She has been a mentor of mine for many years, actually, since I've started. She was one of the first people that I found when, in my Google search of trying to be a freelance writer. And she is bringing so much value to this group today. And I want you to listen because she is talking about how we are already virtual assistants as freelance writers. Think about that. You offer a service that gets money from a business owner. So again, this is something that I want you to listen to with an open mind and know that you can start adding other services to your writing business in order to take away some of that mind boggling hard work you're doing as a writer every single day in and out. So a little bit about Gina. She is a married millennial mama to two precious kiddos from Minnesota. She additionally is the founder of several websites, which now includes her name, GinaHorky.com. Gina specializes in helping everyday folks learn digital marketing skills to launch their own service-based businesses online, working from the comfort of your own home or anywhere. Her background includes making a living as a professional writer, an online business marketing consultant, and a decade of experience in the financial services industry. Welcome to the Savvy Scribe Podcast, a podcast for healthcare professionals who want to build a profitable writing business. I'm Janine Kalbach, your host, and I am a mom to two boys. I'm a wife, a great Dane lover, a registered nurse, and a content writing business owner. I am committed to help you moving your business forward because I've been there. I get it. I understand that life is busy and distracting, but many of us are burnt out at the bedside working too many hours and are ready for a change. Every week I will deliver actionable advice and thought leaders in the industry to help you move along in your business. Welcome to the show. Welcome Savvy Scribes to another episode. And today we have Gina Horky. So hello, Gina. Thanks for coming on the show. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. How are you? Oh, things are good. We were just talking before we started the actual recording that life is crazy during these times. Life is always kind of crazy, but sometimes your plate gets filled with all the things at once and we're working through it hour by hour right now, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. How old are your kids now? So Shelby is going to be eight at the end of June and wow. Braxton is uh, going to be nine in October. So holy cow. Wow. I know. Yeah. Time How old they got to be that old? I have no idea. Well, that's so funny. So little background for my listeners here. Gina was probably the first person I found when I first started my Google journey for freelance writing. And I joined her Facebook group back then. And basically, I think back then it was like a lot of moms. There were a lot of moms in there and who wanted to be writers or were writers. And we kind of helped each other along a little bit. You were producing tons of content. It was like back in 2014 or 2015. So yeah, it's been a hot minute for it sure. It really has, but it's true. Like how, when you start loving your job or you start loving what you do, how time just flies. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. And I feel so blessed. Um, you know, we're recording this still in the midst of COVID places are opening up a little bit, little by little, but as we all know, I don't think this is going to be uh, one day it's here, one day it's gone kind of thing. Right. And um, I just feel so blessed that I have an online business that, you know, we were used to homeschooling the kids. I was just sharing with Janine that, you know, we come down to South Padre Island, Texas every year for a couple of months. Our kids are normally in public school and we unenroll them during January and February so that we can leave the Arctic cold of Minnesota and enjoy the beach and some family time and just be outside. And so far the school district has, uh, you know, supported us as far as not making it hard. Um, we've had to come up with our own curriculum because technically then we become a homeschooling family, which is totally fine on our end. We feel like we, we have it handled, although there's tears and temper, tantru- temper tantrums at different points. Uh, but anyways, you know, my business can be taken with me. And I started my freelance writing business. That was my first four way into offering services online in May of 2014. My husband um, quit his job in 2013 to become a stay-at-home dad when we had our second child. So we have had all of the flexibility in the world to go kind of where we please. 
although we mainly take advantage of coming down here in the winter. So anyways, I just feel super blessed to have an online business because we can still work. Actually, we're working more than ever because everybody's online and we're having lots of conversations with people that are like, how can I do this too? Absolutely. And I think even in this midst of the pandemic, I feel like it's a lot of people are looking for online work because they're either laid off or mm-hmm. they're, they have more time because their job has made them work from home and they realized that they're not probably working as much because you actually get more done when you're working from home, as long as your kids aren't interrupting and, and all the things. But yeah, yeah there's a, I, there's, a lot of perks. Yeah. There's a couple of drawbacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can work all the time, right? Like there's no clocking in and clocking out. But I think for a lot of people, they're learning about working virtually or remotely for the first time because of COVID, because sprinkled in with death counts or active case counts that are rising uh, with this pandemic are the fact of uh, people that are already working from home or have been for a while or side hustles that you can do virtually, like you said, to stimulate your own household income. And so a lot of people are receiving kind of this news and education for the very first time. And it seems like old hat to us. Uh, But here's the thing is this health crisis, this global financial crisis, like it's all of the things at once, right? It is going to change the way that we work going forward. I think whether you want to stay in corporate America or you would like to be kind of a freelancer or self-employed offering your services, like your opportunities are now just going to grow. Um, I think remote work or work from home days are kind of here to stay. And that has forced kind of an archaic view and way of work that we had been holding on to because let's face it, I know that you have a medical background. My sister who's here with us too, she just graduated from her nurse practitioner program, which is amazing. Like even those jobs can be done virtually with the telemed situation that's going on. Oh yes. Oh yes. All of them. Like surgery still kind of has to be performed in person, (laughs) even if there's a robot that's doing it. Like somebody's got to man that robot. But like most jobs these days, you know, we're in the age of what's called knowledge workers, which is I can't remember his name, but it was in the 60s or 70s that there was this uh, guy that kind of said, this is the way that the world is going to change. And here's the next phase that we're going into is knowledge work in the United States, at least. And, and I think that's held true in the economy. And now it's just getting a fast forward button that's being pressed. Well, and definitely with technology, it's so much easier than it could have ever been, you know, with telemedicine and stuff. It's funny, the hospitals are so archaic when it comes to technology. I mean, we have robots that can do surgery, but we can't FaceTime a patient because it's all the HIPAA guidelines and all that. And it's funny in this pandemic how all of a sudden things could just happen. So it's it's interesting. It was that way in financial services because that was a career that I had before I came into this working online space. And it was just at the end of when I was transitioning out that they were forcing offices to go paperless because like, you know, the legal field and and the finance field, as well as like healthcare, like they wanted paper documents that were stayed around forever. And then they're like, oh, no, all of a sudden we're changing our mind. You better get all this scanned in and to our super secure cloud and, and, you know, whatever. But like you said, they had to finally be forced to change and innovate. And now we're allowed to do things that we haven't. And I think that's a good thing for sure. And we'll see how that continues to evolve and just add a little bit of flexibility and bandwidth. I mean, I think one of the things that's really positive that's coming out of this is everybody has a little bit more time and space. So yes, your kids might be home if you're in that type of a situation and they are crazy because everybody's got spring fever and then times a hundred with not being able to actually go anywhere as an outlet. But you don't have to show up to their activities or to, you know, and you might feel cheated that you don't get your, your weekly yoga class or, or whatever, but because we're stuck at home, we have space like never before our schedules have opened up and we have mental bandwidth to think about what's next for me. Well, and I think too, it is going to change in that aspect. I think a lot of people, they just canceled in Ohio here, all the um, summer sports. There's yeah, no, ba- there's no baseball. Well, my cousin is very athletic with her girls. Like she has, they're at baseball or soccer every night of the week. And they were really upset. And we were, we were having a social distancing birthday party for my sister the other day. And we were all like sitting in our chairs, six feet apart. I and love how that's like, like a thing. Right? You know? <laughs> like, who, who 
want you to go back to your story, but I think one of the <laughs> cutest things ever is I was I was talking skyping with a colleague of mine, and he's out in the New York City area, so obviously they're hit harder than most parts of the country. And their son was turning one, and so the parents would go and drop the packages on the front stoop, and then they have this thing called a, a drive-by birthday party. I don't know yeah, if you've the, heard of the these. parade, yep. basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody stays in their two. vehicle and they're yep. singing and they're honking their horn and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, it, there is some joy in that. Like it brings a little bit of happiness to my heart that people are figuring out what way can I get involved in, yes. still, you know, like um, notice and, and celebrate these things. Anyway, well, so you, no, yeah. So saying? then we, she was sitting there and she's like, yeah, I'm really sad for the girl. She's like, but do you know how happy I am that I'm going to like have a summer mm -hmm. and like just be able to slow down. And I'm like, that is the beauty of this. Like, even like scheduling this podcast, I'm like, usually it's planned. So many things are planned around everything else. And I'm like, well, let me check my schedule for nothing. <laughs> it's just <laughs> added on. Like, it's, it's funny. The other day we finally, we had to go, my son had to go to the dermatologist and it was like, oh my gosh, we actually have something we have to do. Like we had to get there on time and on all the things. It's, yeah. It's, it's really, I hope, everybody I hope we slow down a little. Flow. Yeah. It does remind me of like yeah. when we were kids, right? Like, it did not, life was not as crazy as it is before this you pandemic. You went outside right after yes. breakfast and you stayed out until you were called home for dinner and you filled your days with your parents did not know what. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And now we're the same way. Like our parents were just go play, <laughs> go do something. And they have to use their imaginations and be able to think for themselves a little bit. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So that being said, I wanted to ask you, like I found you by Googling and figuring this all out. Who was your mentor? Who helped you from the start? You know, I read a lot of books and I read John Acuff, who was out of Nashville and he's kind of in the career business space. He actually worked on Dave Ramsey's team for a hot minute and published a book. Um, he's a serial author and then a speaker. And he's, if you're on his newsletter, it's actually one of the few that I subscribe to and actually read all the time because <laughs> he's funny but he's sharing like realness of life. And like, obviously the speaking arena has really been hit by COVID. Like there aren't in-person events and you can only do so much virtually speaking to a crowd. Like you can't replace in-personness of certain things. And, sure. and that's definitely one of them. Plus they're at the probably mercy of companies and it's just like they're rearranging their calendars and figuring out all this stuff. So anyways, I'm on his email list, but I had read all of his books. Um, Start, Do Over is another one that's one of his more recent ones. And it got me really thinking about what's next. So as I mentioned before, I was in personal finance and I ended up serving like a, a decade long career there, first as a full blown financial advisor. And I started my career really early at 21 because I graduated from college when I was 18. I went when I was 16, a junior in high school and I'm a little ambitious and uh, type A. And part of that is just because like we grew up really poor and the state of Minnesota would fund my tuition if I went when I was in, when I was in high school. So anyways, long story short, I had chosen this career in finance, even though I was a psychology major, so I didn't even major in finance. <laughs> and uh, then the Great Recession hit a couple years in. So I probably started 2005, 2006, and the Great Recession happened in 2008. And um, then I repositioned myself as um, servicing my small client base. And then I was also a support person real close to home. So it was a good move for us prior to starting our family and um, worked with the small family run, but yet pretty profitable financial planning practice. And that was great because I was so close to home and I was like another member of their family. And like, we just worked really well together, but I got to a point in 2013, probably after my husband quit his job to become a stay-at-home dad, where I wanted more flexibility and freedom. And I also wanted what I was doing to have a direct impact on my own income. So I didn't like the nine to five type of environment. If I could get my work done between nine and 12, why do I need to hang out until five kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And I was pretty efficient at what I did at that time. So I started brainstorming different ways that I could advance my career where I was at. And I even like pitched a plan to buy into the practice and that could have worked out well, but it wasn't like my heart's desire. So I was feeling a little unfulfilled and confused. And so John's books were great because it opened up kind of the world to me on the fact that I didn't have to stick with my initial choice because I felt a lot of guilt around making a career change. And then because I was the breadwinner of our family, it was like duly hard for me to like make a change. And so I read his stuff. I read Tim Ferriss. 
Um, I really liked, um, oh, why can't I think of his name right now? Tom Muir, um, paidtheblog.com, I think is his website. I haven't been in on it in a really long time, but he was definitely one of my mentors in the freelance writing space. And I actually um, subcontracted out. Um, so he landed a few clients and then subcontracted out the writing work to me. And so I was able to get this continuous feedback loop from somebody that was like top in his industry at the time. So that really helped me to jumpstart. But I put myself out there everywhere, right? My first client I actually found on my own. And it was a part of that John Acuff's, he had this 30 Days of Hustle Facebook group. Facebook groups are still a great way to find clients, by the way. Um, and there was somebody that needed some articles written on gluten-free couponing. So this is 2014. <laughs> Gina was not gluten-free and Gina was not a couponer, although I had watched some episodes of Extreme Couponing, if you remember that show. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right? Extreme Hoarder Couponing is what it really <laughs> should have been called. Um, but I had this kind of attitude of I'll figure it out. And I think if you have a good command of Google and YouTube, like anything is find out of all, uh, figure out of all, I guess is how I usually type it, not say it. Um, and so I took on that gig. It was, I think, two posts that I ghost wrote for the blogger and she paid me a whole $40. So $20 <laughs> a pop. Um, and then the next project that I took on was for that Tom and it was writing WordPress theme descriptions. And for those of you that don't know blogging or, you know, website building stuff, it's just the back end of a website. It's the most popular still it's been around forever. Um, and I barely knew what WordPress was, let alone a theme. And so I was getting paid $7.50 per 150 word description. Like I remember these numbers uh -huh. to this day because it was so imperative in the early stages of my journey. And that was like, how do I get paid to write? Again, I didn't have a journalism background. I had a psychology background, which I think serves me well overall, but it's not great for like not having any bylines and you're getting paid to write for the first time, people want to know your experience. So fun story is horkyhandbook.com, which is our main website. It was born in May of 2014 for the sole purpose of housing my freelance writing samples. So I knew that if I wanted clients to hire me to write, they needed to be able to see proof of my skills. And I couldn't put them in like a Word or a Google Doc and turn it into like a PDF and had sharing ability or just attached it to an email. But I thought, okay, I'm going to put them on a website. I'm going to figure out how to build this website myself. And I did like a real clean, uh, simple theme. And it wasn't pretty, but it, w it worked, right? So I didn't mm -hmm. overcomplicate it. I just set it up based on the instructions and it was good enough. And my first few samples are still on the website somewhere. We link to them within our course for the purpose of showing students you got to start where you're at because obviously my writing skills have hopefully um, grown <laughs> quite a bit since that time. And it's not that they were bad. It's just that you just gain more experience. It's and you a get skill, better. yeah. Yeah, you hone it over time. It's like the 10,000 hours thing, right? Like you yep. can consider yourself an expert when you put 10,000 hours into doing something. But don't let not having 10,000 hours of experience prevent you from getting started. I hope that's what people take away from our stories and what we're sharing today. Absolutely. Because I think that's the biggest thing that catches up um, any of our students is that they want to know all of the things in their head and they don't realize that by reading everything, they're not going to get any better at doing the thing. And honestly, what expedites your learning curve and process is by actually putting yourself out there, landing your first few projects, getting a feedback back loop going with those initial clients and showing up, you know, doing your best and then figuring out how do I improve and not taking things personally from like a criticism standpoint, but more of like, how do I use this information if it's not if they didn't think that I was the best thing since sliced bread, you know, what kind of comments can I use to grow and get better? Sure. Well, and it's funny you say that. Like I, you know, Carol Tice. Yes. From, okay. So I just, I don't know, know her, her, but I know yeah, of yeah, her. Yeah. Yeah. No, of her. I just interviewed her for the podcast and she had the same advice is you can research all day long. You can read all day long, but if you don't take action, you're yeah. not going to get anywhere. And it's so true. You see so many people like stall. They're yeah. just stuck. And, and it's out of fear. Don't want to, oh, it's total confidence. fear. I mean, that's absolutely. It, it's not that they're not skilled enough. It's just that they are unsure because they've never done it before. We like to make things in our minds really, really hard when they're new. Well, and, and then when you get rejected, 
Yeah, it's but like, that's it, part of that process. It like, totally like, is, and people like need to, to know that. Like, it's yeah. okay. Steve, Stephen King happen. is the best story about that. Like, I love his story, and this is before the internet and computers. Like, he was writing his, you know, manuscripts for these novels, and before he got accepted and became a big deal like he is today, he would take every single rejection letter, which probably took months to get back to him because it was via yeah. snail mail. Yeah. And he had a nail above probably a typewriter on uh-huh. his desk and he would just stack each rejection letter on this nail and he had a humongous stack by the time he finally got uh, one of his you know novels auctioned or whatever accepted yeah. um, and he just used it as fuel so instead of it, thinking of it as a hundred people telling him no he was thinking of each rejection letter as one closer to his yes yep yep and I, I think that's totally how people need to think about it because you will land something it doesn't if you don't you have to send out a lot of things you'll probably get rejected most of the time and then you'll land something is usually how it goes truth is is you don't hear back from people honestly yeah yeah we we build it up in our head ignore me (laughs) yeah we build it up in our head like somebody's gonna be like how dare you reach out to me and how dare you pitch your services to me and like thinking like they're gonna flip you the bird or whatever right when in reality it's actually a little bit worse because they just don't respond. And it's not even because they don't need your services or see the value. It's just they're too busy, right? So you haven't struck a chord with them either at the right time or in the right way. And that's why you need to get really kind of creative when you're marketing your services. You need to do research on the people that you're pitching to. So if you don't take a little time to do some research um, on who it is that you're looking to have hire you, don't even send a pitch unless it's like a job board or whatever, but still you need to set yourself apart from the competition. If you're not willing to do that, then I don't know that this is the right business for you. Well, and then think about it. Like if somebody pitches you and they know nothing about you and it's oh, so the, generic, it's cookie yeah. cuttered, you don't want to work with that person. It's like, you, you just take it offensive of like, you didn't even get to know me. Like you don't even know what oh, I'm I doing. Archive them now because I yeah. get them every single day and they're a template and some of them are, they don't even, most of them don't even say my name. So like 90% right. are saying hello or hi, Horky Handbook maybe. It's like not that hard yeah. to figure out who owns <laughs> and runs a website, right? You just kind of Google the founder of or yes. you go to the yes. page or you look on their homepage or whatever the case may be. And so I used to, like, I just, I'm this weird type A personality where like i like to close the loop on communication. So I used to like reply to people like that because I know what it's like to be on the other side. But then I got to the point where I'm like, okay, there's too many coming in. They're not taking any time to figure out who I am. So why I don't, they don't deserve anything from me. I, there's no, but email is so weird that way. If you need a productivity hack, it's uh, don't let people add stuff to your to-do list via email that you didn't even ask to contact you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So talking about you know being too busy in your business, I want to transition a little bit into talking about your VA services that you mm-hmm. offer and you teach people how to do. And this was part of my journey a little bit. I was doing a lot of freelance writing, established myself pretty well. And when my um, youngest, he was struggling a little bit in school and in life and all the things. And he's ADHD need, needs medication. And we were going through the transition of pre-K to kindergarten and it was hell. Like we were just like at the doctor every day at counselors at this, at that neurology, you name it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't, I didn't have that bandwidth in my head to write at the time, yeah. but I wanted to keep my business process. going. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I learned through you like, okay, you know what? There are other skills that I have learned over time. And, or if you're not, you know, if you're a nurse or if you're anybody who's done anything on a computer, there's skills you have developed over time that you can offer. And they're not brain heavy in a sense. No. And they're, they're easy things. And, you know, you might, you're taking it off somebody else's plate. So that was my story a little bit with it. But what, didn't you say that you were doing kind of the same thing? Yeah. So I broke into freelance writing first and foremost, and I figured out a way to build recurring revenue into my business by working with clients that had a certain need for content on a regular basis. So my very first goal was to get somebody to pay me for my writing. And so those were one-off projects that I was happy to collect a paycheck, gain experience and get some validation that, Hey, I can do this thing. And then after I got to that point, my next goal, because I really wanted to quit my job, was to figure out how do I kind of depend on a certain amount of income to come in the door each and every month. And so I started taking on reoccurring writing clients. Not all clients are going to be 
in that category. I don't know how I would break it down, but maybe 50% are more project-based and 50% are going to be reoccurring. It really depends on their business model and things like that. So don't take that as a, a hard and fast rule by any means. But basically what happened is in August probably is when the conversation started. So again, I started my business in May, landed my first client probably at the end of May, delivered and got paid on my first two projects in June. And then I was able to continue to increase my revenue month over month, month over month from there on out, um, you know, for a while, not indefinitely. Um, but my overall trajectory has definitely been growth. So anyways, when it gets to like August of this time, I was following this online um, entrepreneur and I was a part of his email list and a part of his community because I was actually a customer of his. And I don't know what my questions were, but I was corresponding with him over email and it seemed like he really wanted to get back to me. He always had some kind of reason that it wasn't sooner than what it was. And I was like, Hey, like, it seems to be that you really want to get back to me and that you're having trouble doing so in a timely manner. Um, you know, you can hire that out. Would you like for me to help you with customer service and email management? And I don't know that I even knew it was a thing. Like right now, you know, we have a course that's email management for virtual assistants. But, but I think I just kind of made that up. I probably wasn't the first one to make it up, but it was just, you know, based on my experience and this interaction, I was like, hey, I can do that for you. I just raised my hand. I identified it, his problem and I offered myself as a solution. He was like, yeah, let's talk about that. So I actually remember, it's so funny how memories you can you know, know exactly where you were because it was such a like a pivotal moment for you. So when I was writing those WordPress theme descriptions, I was up in northern Minnesota. We were on vacation for a week and I hold myself away in my bedroom because we were traveling with my husband's side of the family and all the kids were busy playing together. So I had some time to dedicate to bringing these projects to fruition. And I was excited about that because that meant that I got paid. When I was talking on the phone, his name is Brennan Dunn. He's behind Double Your Freelancing. I was pacing around my yard. And I remember negotiating an hourly rate, which at the time was like $35 an hour. And I just based it off of my income from my day job, broken down over a 40 hour work week and what that would look like. And so he said, yep, let's do it for a couple of weeks and have a trial. And that trial turned into a monthly retainer working with him doing email management and customer service. So September was a big bump in revenue. And it was the first time that I was like, okay, I got this. Like I have enough coming in where I know I can fill the gap in between where I'm at right now and where I need to be. And at the time I needed like $5,000 a month because we had struck everything from our budget that was unnecessary. We had two kids that uh, were probably one in diapers and one that had recently been potty trained, but like three and under at the time. And um, so we were lean and mean with our budget and that's how much we needed to make. And so I put in my notice that month with my office that I worked as a part of. And what's great about that story too, is I'm a real big believer in like parting ways in a happy place if possible. So not yes. just amicable, but how can I leave them in a better situation than when they found me? And for me, that was helping to find and then train my replacement, which was also really great because we identified that she could do 95% of my work but there was 5%, which was writing financial plans that she wasn't able to do at that time. She's since gone through and gotten licensed as a financial advisor herself. And I'm sure she's picking butt at doing it. But what that meant for me is that when I had my last day around Christmas time of 2014, that I landed them as my next client and they paid me $500 a month to come in. I don't know if it was once or twice a month and write financial plans. And that $500 a month just gave me that next little cushion of breathing room, which was amazing. I so, love it. Yeah. I mean, I it's, love it's how fun you're able to, to yeah. yeah, I like use them to help you to build your next stage. I love that because- But that wasn't my intention at all. Of like course. My whole intention was being of service to them because I was so grateful for the six years we had together and what that meant to building, you know, starting our family and, and being able to be the breadwinner. And so- I think that gratitude turned into how, again, do I leave them in a better place than when I found them? And then it just was a natural opportunity. And again, I saw the opportunity and I pitched myself as a solution. And then they were in a position to say yes, because it was what they needed. It wasn't like I held them over the, the coals <laughs> or, you know, like some kind of ultimatum or threat. It was just like, hey, it looks like this might be something that you still need help with. Can I do this as a contractor? And then it ended up being a five month project, which again, gave me enough breathing room. So yeah. the other thing I do want to talk about when it comes to freelance writing versus like virtual assistant services is just second to what you said earlier, 
that writing is kind of very creative. You can break down the process and you can actually sub out parts of the work if you want to. So when you think about the writing process, it's everything from, you know, figuring out the topics and outlining like a blog post or whatever type of writing that you're creating. There's usually some sort of research or sourcing component to it. And so those are things you can do in stages and you can kind of batch your work so that when you are real creative, you can plug in to do the actual writing. But when you're not so creative, maybe you have enough bandwidth to do research and editing or whatever the case may be. And again, you can also scale your writing business by subbing that out to another party and, and then, you know, paying them something that uh, makes sense on both ends and allows you to get your work done quicker. But with the virtual assistant side of things, um, there are certain things that are also still very creative, like creating images. But sometimes writing is like a left brain analysis type activity and creating images might be a right brain, more creative type thing. Um, and then if you have systems in place for doing like customer service, email management work, if you've created templates for yourself, like saved replies or canned responses, there's not as much thinking involved, right? You need to dissect sure. the communication to see what is the main question. What is the thing that I can go, you know, again, a little above and beyond and making sure I answer this correctly the first time. And that um, makes it so there's not as much back and forth later. So what I was looking for was stable income first and foremost. But the secondary thing that I wanted is that I didn't want to have to write all day, every day to make yes. a living. I loved it. But when you turn a passion into a job, it does become work. And to be on all the time when you're a writer can be challenging, like we just alluded to. And so that's where having this hybrid model of additional service offerings can be amazing. And here's the other thing that people don't really clue into is that a lot of people are doing a lot of writing work and they don't even realize it. So let's say you're doing social media for a client. There's usually a heavy amount of writing into creating the post itself and or the description, depending on what platform that you're using. Um, if you're writing email newsletters or even just doing it that, you know, customer service, a lot of that is writing work too. So if you have writing chops, it's going to serve you well in other areas. So I'd love to hear a little bit, like if I was a freelance writer right now who wanted to get started in any of those virtual assistant positions or, you know, additional services that I could offer a client that included writing, do you have, you said you have different courses or is it one large course? Hey guys, guess what? I got another freebie for you. So I just launched a course over in the Savvy Scribe Growth Lab called The Nursing Process Behind Booking Writing Clients, the done-for-you care plan for prospects. Okay, I know, the nursing process, right? Are you asleep? Time to wake up. <laughs> the assessment, diagnosis, outcomes, implementation, and evaluation. Is it all coming back right now? I promise I make it fun and actionable. <laughs> because I hated care plans in nursing school. But I thought I would put this together for us because I feel like it translates into using it for prospects because we can actually implement those steps and land writing clients. So come on over to the scab come on over to the com and click on courses and you can get your free course right now. Back to the show. Yeah, so we have a couple. So I launched my first course in December of 2014. So at the same time when I was leaving my work behind, I had no thoughts around creating my own product. But that same mentor of mine, Tom Ewer, had suggested that I create a product because that's one way to scale your business and include some passive income in your life. And passive income, if you haven't heard of that before, is basically doing work once that you can get paid on over and over again in the future without having to recreate a new deliverable. And so when I caught that bug, I was like, oh my gosh, this totally makes sense. And based on my career in finance, like our whole goal was reoccurring somewhat passive revenue. So I was already in that game and I already understood it and I was 100% committed to it. So anyways, 30 Days or Less to Freelance Writing Success was launched in December of 2014. I think it was December 5th, my stepdad's birthday, if I remember right. <laughs> um, and I spent the month of November breaking it down. So I treated my business. Um, when I launched TorqueyHandbook.com, again, it was just for freelance writing samples. But then I started blogging on a weekly basis so that I would continue to refine my own writing skills, as well as like I was sharing my journey for accountability. So I inadvertently or accidentally created an audience of people that wanted to come back and tune into my story to learn because I was one step further along than where they were. 
And then I decided to create this course, just kind of chronicling my journey, but then also offering like specific actionable advice on how other people can do it. And I spent every morning in November of that year, just cranking out a lesson or two. And so when I created it, it was 30 email lessons that were delivered every day for a month. And then since then, it's, you know, totally evolved and it's in the back end of a courseware and and it's all on demand and all that good stuff. And it covers quite a bit more content than it did in the beginning. But um, so I launched that course and then it was not quite a year later that I took on the, the virtual assistant side of things because I had had that hybrid approach to my own business. I'm going to let you in on a secret. That secret is that a freelance writer is technically a virtual assistant. They just don't call themselves. <laughs> That's that true. Um, and it's based on our definition. And I think our definition makes total sense. It's just somebody that is trading services or skills or time in return for pay from a client or a small business owner that needs that help. And they can do so from afar, which is virtually or remotely. So that's really all it is, is that you have skills that you're going to use and deliver digitally or online. And you're going to contract yourself as a business owner out to other business owners that need that help. So if you look at business owners, they're wearing 50 million hats. And if they're not delegating things to other people, eventually they're going to run out of bandwidth or their business won't be able to grow. So a lot of the things that they will hire out is bookkeeping, accounting, social media, content creation. And that freelance writing aspect is everything from blog posts to white papers, to email sequences, to website copy and sales pages. Like the list goes on within writing in and of itself. There are people that do affiliate marketing under their business. So they'll promote other people's products and services. You can be the liaison for that person and talking with those different affiliate companies and creating review posts or sharing things in an email sequence or on social media. You can also manage an internal affiliate program. So Horky Handbook has one of these, and I believe you are an affiliate for Mm -hmm. our courses. So what you do is spread the news and introduce people like people that are tuning in today that need a training resource to me at Horky Handbook. And in exchange for that, uh, you're going to receive a commission if there's a sale that's made. If there's not a sale that's made, then nobody makes any money. And that's cool too. Um, (laughs) Hopefully, you know, whoever's tuning in will get some nuggets of value and it'll help you to that next step in whatever your journey might look like. So So definitely check the show notes for that, you guys, because there's going to be definitely some opportunity here. So I love that you said like, we're, you're already a VA. Just think of it like that writers out there. You're already doing it. So why not add some And if you're working for corporate America, you're an in-person virtual assistant. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. You know, it's just a, it's a title. And usually what happens is people will go by the title virtual assistant and women tend to draw to this title a little bit more than men. Men tend to specialize a little bit sooner. And so then eventually once you figure out what your thing is or your top couple of things are, then you'll call yourself an affiliate manager or you'll call yourself a podcast producer or you'll call yourself a virtual bookkeeper. So it's just figuring out what are the services that I'm going to offer first. And in the show notes, you'll include your link to 150 plus services you can offer as a virtual assistant and get paid for. For anybody that's not sure what their next service should be, that's what I would do is download that. And when Mm -hmm. you download it, if you want, you can print it off and then you can highlight the things that you know how to do. And you can use a different color highlighter for the things you don't know how to do, but that you're interested in learning. And then just take a, a pen or a black Sharpie and just draw a line through anything you're not interested in or that you know how to do, but you hate. Like, that's okay. Like, let's get polarizing here because you only need two to three top services that will do a couple things for your business. It'll allow you to get specialized enough where you can become the known person for, um, you know, writing uh, white papers. I have a girlfriend a friend of mine named Sarah who just kills it as a freelance writer doing total B2B um, business to business type material that she writes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that if you're not hearing that you want to specialize, but you first have to take the 10,000 foot view of like, what am I interested in? What do I know how to do? How can I repurpose my current skills? And then what things do I seek out specific training for? And the cool thing about the age that we live in now is like learning is on demand and it's everywhere. You just have to find your reputable source and who you want to learn from because some courses are going to be better than others, but you don't have to go back to college anymore in order to like reinvent your own career. And in this case, you're going to be building your own business and building a business is not scary. Is it Janine? No. I mean, I think it was a little bit of a knowledge kick at first. Like you're like, 
what do I not know? And then you just learn it. Like, it's like any, any skill. I think the whole college thing, like that kind of made me confused at, at first. I was like, do I need to like do something in English to become a good writer? Or are the people going to take me seriously? But they do. So, oh, totally. you know, you don't have to go back to school. Thank God. So the right. Great thing about working online is that people understand that skills are more important than education. So yep. you need probably some resources, whether it's reading books and blog posts, listening to podcasts, taking online courses, like you got to get plugged into some reputable sources if you don't know what you don't know. And then you start learning what you don't know. And then you figure out the specific solution to learning what you don't know if that's what you should be doing. You perfect um, it over time too. You yeah. Know, you start, even if you're a good writer, there's always something to know. There's always something to learn and you just keep growing on it. And I think too, the VA stuff is so good because it's, even if you don't want to do writing, like say you really are like, you know what? Yeah, I could write social media. Yeah, I could do white papers, but really I'm looking to get away from the writing a little bit. Yeah. So then do some research or do um, bookkeeping or graphic design, something like that, that you might be good at, or you might want to learn because that's still a task that people need help with. Project management is a big one that I feel like is undervalued yes. um, because I think business owners understand how busy they are and they know if you go to like eisenhowermatrix.com, there's this amazing infographic and video that explains this whole theory, but basically you can separate your to-do list into things that are urgent and important, things that are not urgent, not time sensitive, but are important to the growth or scalability of your business. That's the opportunity area for a lot of business owners is that they never get time to start those projects, but those are the projects that are going to take their business to the next level. There are things that are not urgent, not important. They should really just get deleted. And there are things that are urgent, but not important. And a lot of the times those are things that get like delegated. So I think it's like urgent and important you do now. The urgent, not important, you need to schedule time in order to get it done. The not urgent, not important, you just delete it. And then the not important but urgent needs to get delegated so it's it's really great it'll really help you to clue in not only to like your own productivity habits but this is like my favorite strategy for figuring out how to land clients or land more work with your current clients is to figure out what's on their to-do list that's not getting done but it stays on their to-do list because it's important so it might yes. not be urgent but it's important and you can do a couple of things you can be the person that does that stuff for them or you can be the person that frees them up to do it by taking other stuff that doesn't uniquely need to be done by them off their plate. And then there's a third option, which is becoming a project manager for those things. Good. So tell me these days, how many people are on your team? Ooh, um, we have two businesses and multiple brands by now. Yeah. Um, on our core team, there's seven, but probably like a dozen different people. The fun part is that Everyone, with the exception of my sister, has been uh, in our community and a student of ours. So we oh, totally good. like hire within, and I love it because they're also extremely loyal. They believe in our mission, which you know is is helping people to redefine their career future. And um, yeah, well, and you know amazing. they're hard workers because they seeked you out to be a student, and then. Oh, they were a student and then like it just naturally came yeah. up. Like it wasn't that they wanted to work with me and then they yeah. were like, oh, I'll just become a student and then I'll work But it's so nice to journey. be like, I know that yeah. they're going to be hardworking because they, they took initiative. Right. And, you know, yeah. those people that don't take initiative, no matter where you go, are the people that aren't going to go higher or, you know, become a lead at what they do. Exactly. How exciting. Yeah. So, the fun, fun part about it though, too, is like I, on Fridays, I've been having like one-on-one -on -one calls with different team members and one of our team members is Zach. Zach is from the United States, but he is married to somebody that lives in Mexico. And so they're down there right now. And so nice. you can be a virtual assistant all over the world and you can work with clients all over the world. And our team is pretty diverse. We used to have somebody over in uh, Europe. We don't at this moment, but Canada, Mexico, and then domestic is where our team is represented right now. But other people have team members from all over the world or clients from all over the world. But anyways, Zach had a lot of potential and he's like hungry, kind of what you were just talking about. Yeah. And I love it because now he's started with just doing our social media. He's grown into running paid advertising. He is uh, learning editing and design skills. So he's uh, really helping us to expand our YouTube presence. And like, I've been able to plug him into different training resources or we've internally trained him. And so this is really kind of fun because a lot of people 
don't realize that your clients will actually upgrade your skills for you by teaching you how to do things. So you have Love to get it. in with a client in the first place, but if they like, know, and trust you and you've done a good job in whatever you've started with, they would hands down train you to do other stuff for your their business then go and find somebody and interview and hire externally exactly and then when you you know if you're done with that client later on they've moved on you've moved on now you have another skill set to offer someone else which is oh, always yeah great. they can nobody can take it from you at all and i've invested my money our company resources into training for these people too and that's a win win for both absolutely. people absolutely so tell me when you first started outsourcing things to VAs in your own business. What did you start with? Oh, that's a fun one because I wasn't in the market of hiring anybody. And <laughs> Mickey is the one that I mentioned that was over in Europe. And so it was 2015, probably like November, I feel like. And she just emailed me. She was a student of ours. And she said, Hey, like you added on this VA course in another community, you're probably not going to be able to keep up with these communities as they continue to grow and you are helping more students forever all by yourself. Would you like to pay me to be your moderator? And I was like, huh, okay. And <laughs> that's how that relationship was born. <laughs> so we agreed on kind of a scope of work and we agreed on payment. And then she ended up doing a lot of writing for us and kind of progressed in her role as well. Um, so she was my first hire. She pitched me out of the blue and identified that need. So it was a just a fun story because it was like how I got started when I pitched Bre Brennan to hire me for doing the customer service type stuff. Love it. It's live. My first course. I'm so excited to tell you guys that my first course, Plan, Create, Launch, Land, and Grow Your Health Writing Business is now live. If you head on over to growthlab.thesavvyscribepodcast.com, it's available to purchase right now. Jump on in. Everybody is saying so many wonderful things, and I can't wait for you to be a part of it. <laughs> very good. Very good. So um, what else? So for VAs right now, are you still doing, I remember I was part of your VA like service thing for like clients. Clients would send in like pitches, yep. or you, you actually pitch as like a VA to clients, but you guys actually found the clients. Yeah, so we have something called the VA Leads Community. That's it's it. <laughs> only available for our students of 30 days or less to either freelance writing or virtual assistant success. You can add to your order when you enroll in the course for $1 your first 30-day period. So it's like a trial period for this community. And that's where we have like office hours on a regular basis where we'll be answering specific questions that are in addition to the program material. Um, so maybe somebody needs some clarification on something that we're teaching or more likely they have a situation going on with a prospective client or client that they're working with that they want some feedback on or they want to get our feedback on their website or pitches or whatever the case may be. We have tons of conversations going on within the regular discussion thread as well as um, during these live office hours periods. And uh, then we also offer hosting. So for people that want to set up their own website, it's not a must, but we offer hosting as a part of their membership. So that covers the cost for that. And then we do bring unique client leads into the community too. So we're not taking on clients for the most part, me or the team, uh, but people still find us. Plus we actively market on our students' behalf because it doesn't, there's nothing that makes me happier than when we have student success. So I love the emails that are like, hey, I just landed my first client, or hey, I just quit my day job, that was my goal, or hey, oh, I wanted yeah, to bring awesome. in you know, $1,000 a month because I'm a stay-at-home parent, and I, we just got to go to Disney World, or whatever. Like That just fills my bucket, and Absolutely. we get to play a part in that. Plus, I just, you know, I'm a natural marketer and connector, like you were talking about your husband earlier, so yes. it just makes sense because I get to help my entrepreneurial friends, too. I'll get an email every week in my inbox that's like, hey, so do you, like, I just got one last week from Alyssa and she's like, Hey, so I need somebody to write email funnels for me. Do you like have somebody that you would recommend? And, um, nice. then we just have her fill out a form. Look them and, up. Yeah. Yeah. The great part about so it cool. is, yeah, we have so much experience with helping to identify what clients needs are because they don't always know how to clearly communicate that. So that's a part of our process. It's free to the client, to the entrepreneur or small business owner that needs to hire help but we have them fill out this kind of intake form and we know the right questions to ask so that we can get the right details for our students and alum to be able to do that a little bit more research and then to send a, a pitch that we help them to craft that's unique and um, you know personable 
and they don't have to, like the hard questions are out of the way as far as what services do you need, what's your budget, all these different things. We already collect that for them in advance. Oh, that's always nice. And the, um, on the business side of it as like a client, of course, like there's things in my business. I could be like, Oh yeah, I need help with all these things. Oh, the, uh, SEO and blog posting and formatting and this mm-hmm. and that you can think of a mile long list. So that's cool that you guys ask those questions prior to the VAs going in there and saying, I can do this. I can do that. Cause that would be so overwhelming to the business owner saying right. like, okay, I could do this, but the budget budget's only so big, you know, especially and, and for our- small businesses. Our community actually hires each other. So they'll submit their own lead requests or they'll submit a lead request on behalf of their client because they don't do the service. And so they nice. know that they can refer them to our community and somebody else is going to have the skill set that they don't have and don't want to develop. So listeners, if this is something you're interested in, again, you guys are already a VA with being a freelance writer and you can add on services and it's just like a go-to place to get clients right off the bat. So Definitely, we'll put that link in the show notes as well. So, yeah. what's next for Gina Horky and Horky Handbook and all the things? What do you What are you guys planning on doing? You know, the rest of this year, going into next year. Yeah. So, one of the projects that we launched in late last year over the Black Friday Cyber Monday weekend was Podcast Production School. So, we got into the space with the freelance writing course, which is obviously focused on specific. Um, specialized services, although that course does go into a little bit on how to become a better writer. It doesn't teach you like how to write a paragraph, you know, because like right. most of us have enough like schooling behind us that we know how to put together a concisive, um, you know, blog post or whatever. We do have like formatting tips and we break down what needs to go into an intro and body and conclusion. And there's all sorts of stuff to help you to progress as a writer. Um, but it's mainly about starting a freelance writing business from scratch and how to scale that over time so that it's as profitable as you can make it. And then the virtual assistant course is very much about identifying your core service offerings and your target market and how much to charge and how to look for clients and how to become more specialized over time. And then what we got called to do from our audience is we want more hard skills. Like how do we learn more hard skills? And so that's where we launched email management and a project management course. We have one towards uh, vir- virtual assistants that want to work in real estate as like a transaction manager. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this last winter, we did podcast production school, which is amazing because as a podcast producer, you can do all of the things from editing audio to distributing episodes, to marketing the podcast, to creating show notes, which is a writing kind of thing, yep. right? Yep. There's so much that goes into podcasting, as you very well know, yes. that um, that's something where you can offer all the services or just part of it. But we teach the how. We teach the hard skills of the things that I just mentioned, which is super fun. Um, so what's next for us is we'll have a social media for virtual assistance course coming out in the next month. And that'll be under the Horky Handbook brand. The podcast production school is under its own brand um, because we're just trying some different things out from an SEO perspective. Uh, specifically, but the social media course is really fun because this is probably one of the top needed services from business owners because they just don't want to learn the ins and outs of every platform or spend their time posting on social media when they need to be doing whatever it is that they do best, whether it's creating products or conducting services is typically the two camps that they fall into. Um, so social media is like a necessary evil when you have an online presence. And um, most people that want to offer the services, they've only been on it personally. So they don't really understand how businesses use it to market. And so that's what we're going to unveil in this course is really setting a very firm foundation for the top six platforms that exist. So we're not going to teach how to become a specialist at Pinterest. We do have a course for that with my business partner, Kristen. Um, And that's you know, because that platform in and of itself, any of the platforms, like there's just so much to know and they change all the time. Yes. The social media course is going to give a firm foundation to what are the six top platforms, how to optimize profiles and kind of talking about strategy with scheduling out content and writing content and, and images and some different things. So you'll leave that feeling like you can definitely land your first social media client for sure. 
And you will know way more than your client does more than likely, unless they're in the social media game, as far as offering services themselves. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. You have so much going on, which is awesome. You know, I think that's great. So where can, so horkyhandbook.com, where yep. else can people find you or follow you and, you know, get on your email list and all the things? Yeah, I would start with just that 150 plus services list, if that is kind of what you're interested in expanding on. I mean, I'm on all the social channels. We're kind of doing a rebrand to my name, Gina Horky, and we actually have GinaHorky.com uh, getting going in the background so that it can be this umbrella sorts mm -hmm. for all of the different brands so that people can learn about what it is that we're doing. And, um, you know, I can continue to authentically share kind of my journey as an online business owner, which is the fun part for me. Absolutely. Well, I thank you so, so much for giving all this value to everyone listening today. And I hope you come back soon. I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can get real specific into whatever topic you want to jump on the horn about and yes. it, it'll be fine for sure. It Thanks will. for everybody for tuning in. It's been yes. a lengthy one, but hopefully you've gotten one or two little nuggets. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Thanks so much. Gina. Take care. That's a wrap for Bye -bye. today's episode Bye -bye. of the Savvy Scribe. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd love for you to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Until next time.